In my last video, I asserted that the presence of moral disagreement challenges ethical intuition and moral realism, the latter being a meta-ethical position that William Lane Craig holds which asserts that moral values exist independent of the mind and can be true or false. I engaged in a very brief exchange with the Cartesian theist over the contents of my video. In a nutshell, he disagreed with my assertion that the burden of proof should be distributed solely to the moral realist and that DPR Jones and I use moral language like moral objectivists. But I prefer to call the latter position moral realism to extinguish any ambiguity between moral objectivism and Ayn Rand's objectivism. I will discuss the use of my moral language later in the video, but the primary purpose of this video serves to defend my meta-ethical views while challenging the validity of moral realism with a two-pronged argument. My hope is that by better clarifying my position, I can engage in a fruitful and enlightening discourse with the Cartesian theist over a topic which is very dear to both of our hearts, the topic of ethics. So without further ado, join me on a magical ride through space and time. In this video, I will be defending the meta-ethical view known as non-cognitivism, which states that moral utterances do not express propositions and therefore cannot be true or false. Emotivism is a form of non-cognitivism which holds the view that moral utterances like killing is wrong is equivalent to saying boo killing. In other words, moral utter utterances do not refer to facts about the external world but simply refer to our own mental attitudes and dispositions about killing. Personally, I think that emotivism is problematic and is too simplified to capture the complex nuances of moral judgments and therefore I will be, I'll be defending a view more or less similar to Richard Hare's universal prescriptivism which holds that moral utterances are not propositions but imperatives or commands. I hesitate to hold any position too strongly because I think that many philosophical problems are not cut and dry or black and white and that moral realism sometimes seems to me to be almost as strong of a position as moral anti-realism. So I think this is the beauty of philosophy and my apologies for the prelimina preliminary tangent, but I felt that this needed to be clarified before jumping right into the first prong of my argument. As J.L. Austin pointed out, language does more than just describe or reference the state of affairs in the external world, but can actually change states of affairs in accordance to the speaker's intentions. This is known as the Speech Act. Take a well-known example by John Searle. The question, can you reach the salt, takes the grammatical form of an interrogative sentence, but is an imperative because it's, it's expressing a request in the grammatical form of a question. This is an indirect speech act because a speech act, in this case an imperative, is being performed by way of another speech act, a question. So I do not intend to provide a complete taxonomy of speech acts in this video, but I do want to discuss two acts, which are constitutives and performatives. Constitutives are statements which describe reality and can therefore be true or false. Performatives change the social reality which they describe. They are speech intertwined with action and cannot be true or false. So let me explain performatives in greater detail. When I say shut the door, I am not describing reality so much as I am attempting to make the listener's actions fit the propositional content of my utterance, in this case a command or imperative. Performatives cannot be true or false according to Austin. For example, can you reach the salt and shut the door are neither true or false, yet they convey meaning nonetheless. Treating speech acts as propositions when the speech act's meaning is not based on its truth condition is what J.L. Austin refers to as a descriptive fallacy. The central question is, are moral utterances constitutives in that they describe reality, or are they performatives in that they are intended to change the social reality in which they describe? So, if we say, the ball is blue and stealing is wrong, both predicates convey a property of the subject, but the predicate wrong does not convey a verifiable property of stealing in the way that the predicate blue does in fact convey a verifiable property of the ball. If wrongness is not a property of stealing, then what does it refer to? Does moral language describe the world, or just our own attitudes and preferences? So. If moral utterances do not describe or correspond to properties in the external world, they must be performative and thus are not truth apt. But let me expand on this a little bit more. The great logician and philosopher Rudolf Carnap said, quote, Most philosophers have been deceived into thinking that a value statement is really an assertive proposition, 
But actually, a value statement is nothing else than a command in a misleading grammatical form." End quote. So I want to assert that moral utterances are not assertions which have truth values, but are commands or imperatives and are, and are thus not truth apt. So moral utterances are performative speech acts because they are not describing the external world, but are intending to direct the actions of others. When we say stealing is wrong, we are attempting to persuade another of the wrongness of stealing, considering that wrongness is not a verifiable property. So when the moral realist utters, stealing is wrong, they are indirectly implying that one ought not to steal. And as I noted before, this is an indirect performative speech act, because when someone says stealing is wrong, I understand that they mean do not steal, which seems confusing considering that performative and constitutive speech acts share the grammatical form of declarative sentences. So in order to effectively dispute my position, the moral realist w must do one of two things. One, they must deny that moral utterances are imperatives disguised as statements of fact. Or two, they must hold the position that moral utterances do indeed correspond to objective properties in the universe. So in other words, the moral realist must assert that moral values are part of the furniture of the universe. So by rejecting the assertion that moral utterances are not constitutives but performative speech acts, the moral realist must assert that moral utterances do indeed describe statements of fact and are thus truth apt. But in doing this, the realist must make ontological and metaphysical claims that are not sufficiently justified. Enter John Mackey's argument from queerness. So according to Mackey, moral properties are too metaphysically queer to be part of our ontology, and in doing so, realists are forced to adopt problematic intuitionist accounts of moral knowledge. Mackey claims that if moral values do exist, they must be fundamentally different than any other entity or property in the known universe. The queerness of moral facts does not solely rely on the fact that they are unverifiable, but that moral values would differ from any property in the universe because of their power to influence our actions. He notes that the connection between an action like stealing and the fact that it is wrong is not a logical entailment, and since wrongness is not a verifiable property, wrongness must then somehow supervene upon the action of, steal of stealing in some queer platonic sense. Because of wrongness's unverifiability, we must therefore postulate a special faculty in order to ascertain the mysterious connection between an action and its wrongness. Mackey claims that moral values are epistemically queer because we cannot know moral values through sense perception, logical inference, or introspection. Therefore, according to Mackey, we must postulate a unique moral intuition. So, not only are moral properties unlike any other entity in the universe, but that we can only come to apprehend these properties through an intuitive faculty that is unlike any other way in which we come to have knowledge about entities. So in conclusion, Mackey demonstrates that the moral realist must violate Occam's razor by postulating unnecessary entities to explain moral values while the moral anti-realist need not take the same route. These two arguments that I've brought forward have several components. While the first argument from non-cognitivism is a semantic argument, the argument from queerness attacks the ontological, metaphysical, and epistemological status of moral values. Keep in mind that Mackey's argument from queerness was formulated in 1977 and was primarily a reaction to ethical intuitionists, which have since fallen out of favor. And I would also like to point out that I'm using Mackey's argument from queerness autonomously from his overall position, known as air theory. Air theory is an anti-realist meta-ethical view, yet it is a cognitivist position, in that Mackey thinks that all moral utterances are inherently false. In this video, I am primarily defending non-cognitivism, which, while also being an anti-realist position, is incompatible with air theory, because I am asserting that moral utterances are not propositions and cannot be true or false. As I said before, the moral realist must either reject the premise that moral utterances are performative speech acts and therefore correspond to objective properties in the universe, but taking this route, they are met by Mackey's argument from queerness. Or otherwise, they can accept that moral values do not describe or correspond to objective properties in the universe, and therefore moral utterances are performative speech acts and are thus not truth apt. Before concluding, I want to answer one of the Cartesian theists' objections to my William Lane Craig and Moral Disagreement video. He notes that DPR Jones and I are moral subjectivists, but our use of moral language betrays this meta-ethical position because we talk as if moral language is objective. 
I have attempted to be more careful than TPR Jones on this point, although I don't think this is a very strong objection. I also want to point out that I'm also an anti-realist concerning the ontological status of mathematics, yet I can use mathematics just as well as any realist can. For example, the Pythagorean theorem is true so long as one accepts Euclid's axioms, but rejecting the fifth parallel postulate, the Pythagorean theorem does not hold in the non-Euclidean geometries. So in other words, the Pythagorean theorem is true relative to Euclid's original axioms. The notion that we can use moral language and mathematics despite being anti-realist about their foundations is a position called fictionalism, which I will discuss in greater detail in my next video. I also think it's a little bit unfair that I just attack moral realism without offering my own views concerning the foundations of morality up for scrutiny. So in my next video, I will be discussing this as well. Anyway, that's all I got. Thank you.